Thanks for being here tonight. So let's get an idea of who's in the room. Uh, early ed families? Okay. Early ed. Six to nine families? Nine to twelve? There we are. Twelve to fourteen? And fourteen to eighteen year old families. None. 14-year-old. Oh, we're having to work on that. Okay, who, who didn't raise their hand, and why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> you were here for Girl Scouts, darn it. That sounds mm. Um, Thank you, Brenda. I have my background screensaver on. I was like, oh, no, this will come up a thousand times. So. Uh, so we're here just to kind of talk about um, kind of who we are, some of the things that you already know, some that might be new but to try to help you to feel as best oriented to the school so you know who to reach out to, um, what you might do to try to learn more um, about this weird school that you're, you're now a part of and you're part of our family. And, um, you know, and get to know you a little bit. Uh, I mean, I just would ask that if you're going to ask something specific about your child, wait till afterwards because we are videotaping and we don't want to be disrespectful to that young person. Um, but if you have general questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. This is like our conversation together. So we're really, you know, glad to be here with All right, Jason. Yep. You just will click that little, you know, you can turn it towards you. There's plenty of space there, yeah. You can go ahead and click the square. Click it again. <laughs> there we go. This is our newest picture. Isn't that awesome? Aren't they beautiful? We have the most uh, amazing group of people we get to work with every day. And out there on our national playground, it's hard to get them out of the national playground after we took that picture. So, um, you know, and it's the best family. So we um, are really fortunate in that way in a time when um, things are different in our world, right? Sometimes people aren't um, as happy as maybe they were back in 2019, or we've just had, you know, new experiences. and. Um, children are moving around. I've asked the Indiana Department of Education to give a graph of how many children are moving in and out of schools and home schools. There's a lot of shifting and transitioning that's happening across the world, really. And people are rethinking. What do they believe? What do they want for their children? What do they want for their families? So, um, you know, that's, that's what's kind of brought you here today. Uh, we have this, so when we started the school back in 98, and I'll probably say different things about that a couple different times, um, I looked up the PTA and the PTO, and I was like, gosh, you know, it seems to be centered around fundraising, and, you know, I just wanted something that was centered around parents involving themselves, right? And so um, I got together with a group of our families in this little strip center over there behind Lee's Fried Chicken. Um, off Grant Line Road, and I said, okay, what can we create? And so we started brainstorming, we came up with Parent Involvement Partnership, and that has stuck. And the, the group that we had before COVID kind of weaned over the last couple of years, and so it's in a rebuilding part right now. So if you didn't mark that um, button or, or put some information in about uh, PIP, um, Parent Involvement Partnership that you would like to be a part of, kind of a restart, of that for a new year, um, we'd love for you to, and so you're welcome to email me personally if you like it, bfondren at shiningminds.com, so, um, but that's happening as well, and I forgot to introduce our, our, our young people, our very young <laughs> office staff, we call them the cupola staff, right, this is your first third period question tonight, which means I'm going to ask you, what does that mean, cupola staff, you know why we call them cupola staff? No idea, I'm not going to make any eye contact. Jason has an idea. No idea. No idea. What'd you say? Do you know what a cupola is? No, this is a man. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you think about that, that jet of, of windows that jumps off of the roof at the entrance of the school. That's the architectural name for that. It's called a cupola. So we just decided, again, you know, like we had this great luxury and opportunity to rethink what we name anything. We, we built this building and we became our own entity way back in 98 and then we added to it here. And so it was like, we don't want to be like the office staff or the admin, so it's the Cupola crew. And so introduce yourself, Cupola staff. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, my name is Paige. I'm the health services coordinator. Um, I kind of fill the role of the schoolers. Um, I write the health plans and take care of all of your lovely children who get hurt 
or injured or need a quiet moment sometimes. Um, I am a parent here as well. I have a kiddo in early ed and one in violence. And she works with our school nurse that contracts with I us. I do, yeah. Um, her name is Taylor Thomas, who is the, the wife of one of our other co-workers, uh, Joan Thomas. So. And my grandson has been dying to go have a play date with Will. So he came home with your address. You know, I understand. I, <laughs> so. He knows his address. That's right. <laughs> So I'm going to go grab my kids and go home, but it was nice to see all of you. I've already spoken with some of you, but if you have any questions, any health concerns or anything, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, Paige. <laughs> all right, I'm Kelly. I work right next to Paige. Um, I do attendance, so if you're calling in late, I'm adjusting your attendance. Um, I support Paige with health needs as well, So, and both my kids graduated from here. So. She does a million other things. That was just a very small yeah. <laughs> intro. Thanks, Kelly. Uh -huh. I'm Melissa. I am the finance oh. coordinator, and I work in the same office as Karina and Jesse. Um, I also have two kids that graduated from here. It's the only school they've ever known. Um, and I work really with HR, payroll, financial stuff. Um, Going to be transitioning to like payments, so too. So. Yeah, any questions? I'll probably ask Prina first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Prina. Um, first off, I don't get offended if you miss say my name or misspell my name. I will work with you to say it as close as possible to be correct. Um, I work with you for enrollment, for extended learning. Um, any learner related questions you have, I'm happy to help. Um, that's about it. I have a kiddo in. Uh, in the islands, so she is 13. Yeah, she's in eighth grade. So, so this this group really controls all the things that make our school function. It's like the heart of the brain, or I don't know what the anatomy would be, but anyway, we're very uh, thankful for them. And Jesse's also up there in that crew. Go ahead, Jesse. Sure. Uh, I'm Jesse. I'm your community ambassador. I'm in front of the camera, and I didn't want it to be like right here. Um, <laughs> I'm just your sort of your bridge to what's happening here. Send you lots of emails. It's really. Um, we know if you didn't open it. Uh, so <laughs> we know. Must um, us did. It's right. So you know. Anything happen here? Anything exciting? You know, you're going to get an excitedly worded email from me, um, and, and I'm also happy to be first point of contact. This year's been cool because I've gotten a whole lot of. I didn't know where to start, so I figured I'd start with you. Here's my question, or my 13 questions. That's great. That's fine. You can always start with me, right? Just reach out to me. I may not be the one to to know the answer. But I'm two desks away from the person who knows all the answers right now. So, you know, I'll, I'm happy to. I, it'll be a long way to email, too. I'm sorry. I can't, can't not. The emails regularly will be short, but if you ask the question, I'm going to make sure I cover everything. So, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And you also have a daughter, daughter at the school? Yes, I do have a daughter in the Gemstones. She's been here since she was in uh, Ellipse in kindergarten. This is all she's ever known. So it's wild to, to know the, what we had, my wife and I, which was fine and great in many ways, but this is like Hogwarts compared to, you know, it's, it's really cool that this is all she knows. Did you say that about yours, Brayden? No. No, you didn't even mention your teen. No. I mean, she's so much in the teens now, I forgot her earlier years. She's been here since she was three years old, so 10 years we've been here. Oh, wow. Thank you all so much. Yeah, come on in. Hey. Um, anybody have any questions right now? You're just like, I really want to know this, or can you help me understand that? I just want to invite you at any point in this conversation, like this is your time. This is your time to get your needs met. So, anybody have anything right now? Oh, yeah. I'll ask this. Sure. Five minutes later. Um, Oh, we already answered that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have like five kids, but one in here, and so she's in the middle of the other four. I have no clue, like, right? what do your graduates do for jobs? Like, do they go to college? Do they do training school? Like, I don't really care what my daughter does when she finishes, as long as she can, you know, 
Okay, the old screw driver right I'm not looking. She can go anywhere that that leads. So like, yeah. But I'm like a new kid. Like, I haven't even had time to talk to my wife about all this. So you got. I'm not against her for. I'm just like I don't. Right, know you're just curious. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so you know, we've had. Gosh, what's it going to be, Jesse? Twelve graduating classes. It's going to be the thirteenth this coming May. Yeah. I think it's about. Closer to 400, 400. graduates. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the sorry, I don't know the stats right off the top of my head. Yeah, but, but uh, um, yeah, college so my, attendance rates like 95 percent, right? The, of of who applies gets in. Yeah, um, we've, yeah, we're doing pretty good there. So you know, um, so a little bit of history. My husband and I started the school for our own children. Uh, at the time they were two and a half and five years old. And so um, I, you know, we were both wondering what we wanted for our own children. We've been through public and private school. And so we um, uh, learned about the Montessori philosophy, actually like a 60 Minutes episode, and was shocked to see that, I, you know, I went through four years of college to be an educator, and I had no idea who Marie Montessori was, and that she was a doctor, et cetera. And so we, you know, got together with some other people. We started a nonprofit organization. I asked the board to hire me to be the school leader. And I had two goals for the school. One was to be at, at an age level every year through high school. At that time, in 1998, there was a dozen Montessori high schools in the nation, um, so not very many. And so I was talking to them, learning, and so forth, and all being building towards that process. So. The other goal was to eventually be tuition free, so personally I lobbied for charter school legislation in Indiana and worked with the legislator Teresa Lovers who had eventually passed the bill. Um, and in 1998 we had we started with 54 children that was at capacity of the school. We kept adding an age level, the charter school law passed in 2001, we converted to a to charter school in 2002 under the, um, under, under the support of Ball State University, their are authorizer. And so we kept adding an age level each year. We moved into that building in 2006. This and the teens program in 2008. Um, our oldest was in the first graduating class. There was 13 graduates the first year. Um, you know, I always say to families, I don't believe our school is a college prep school, but it's not not a college prep school. So it's a, a human prepared preparation school. So we want to help whatever that young person's goals are. In, in collaboration with their family to be the best version of themselves. So sometimes that's a person that wants to go on to do mission work, and sometimes that's a person that wants to go to Yale. You know, um, not that we've had a graduate right now that's gone to Yale, but we've had graduates that have applied to all the places and made their own decisions about that. Um, so my oldest, when she graduated, um, she went to IU Bloomington, which is kind of a tradition in our family. Um, she went on to get her PhD at Notre Dame, and then, you know, so she's a psychologist practicing in the area now. So if people want to do that, that's an option for them to do that. Even at the first year of our graduation, which we learned a lot more in, in 13 years than that. My youngest, who is much more of a dreamer, you know, never so great at testing, which my oldest was really great at, wanted to go, you know, um, she got a full ride scholarship to a liberal arts school of our Harbor, Maine. But she wanted to go to IU because that was the tradition for our family. And they didn't accept her. And I said, well, what do you want to do about it? She goes, what can I do? And I said, well, who makes the decisions? She looked it up and said, the, there's a board you know, of people at IU. And I said, well, what do you want to do? She goes, how do I write them? How can you find me at you? So through this process, she wrote them and said, you should choose me. You know, Here are all the things I've done outside of my SAT score. And you know, I think I'm worth it. And I want you to give me money to go there, too. They gave her a few hundred dollars, but they did accept her into the program, and she's hopefully going to go to PA school starting this January. But she's been on her own journey, you know, like we believe that, um, and we try to encourage our families to promote independence, self-thinking, self-regulation, you know, those kinds of things, instead of, you know, when we have a new team that comes to the school, the first thing they usually say is, you don't talk so much at the school, because they're not used to talking to adults, many of them, right? Like, they're in kind of a, an environment where they listen to adults more than they talk to them. I hate that. Yeah, and, and so, you know, like, um, we had a young man that started today, and he was struggling with some, some processes, and there were three or four of us trying to, you know, give him a pep talk, and... Um, you know, you can just imagine he's like, why are all these people talking to me? And like, you know, and, and like, are we being unkind? No, you're really nice, but I've just never talked this much to adults before. 
right? So, you know, like, it, it really is about trying to help that young person to find themselves. If we had members of our alumni um, in this environment, they would tell you one of the best things about this school for them, they come up with all the time, is the internships. Like, they do at least four full semester internships um, before they graduate, which is so crucial. You know, and they learn, like, oh, I didn't want to be a tech. I thought I wanted to be a vet tech, and after I did that for a semester, I realized I want to be the veterinarian, or I want to do something different. Like, I love animals, but I don't like blood, right? So they get to know all of those pieces about themselves before they start investing in certificates or college or whatever direction they go next. So does that give you a little piece? Is that helpful? That's really helpful, yeah. That's like, you have some serious driving vision right now. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thanks. it's like, I have a feeling like this is a blog school, nobody cares. Like, but this is like, the real deal, you're into it. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I will tell you, I'm not the only one. You've heard that from the people of staff, you, you would hear that from any teacher that's here. Um, one of the teachers that was helping us with this young person today, you know, just really trying to make a difference, really trying to, um, you know, meet the connection between young people. Well, not that we're perfect, we're not, but we try every day to, to walk along. So. Anything else someone has on their mind? Yeah. It's not uh, philosophy related, but I know there's a fish aquarium in my daughter's studio. Yeah. And we have a small little fish room, and I was wanting to see who do I get with to yeah. look into that. Yeah, Michael and Sylvester. Michael Sylvester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know him. You, you, okay, yeah. So he actually was the teacher in that studio, and now he's moved to a different position in the school, so he help them to get that started, so he still kind of helps that studio with it, so. Okay. It was a saltwater fish tank, he just converted it this summer to a non-saltwater fish tank, but okay. he's kind of rebirthing that process, too. Yeah, okay. great, you know, awesome. Michael. Yeah, awesome. All right, I'll do it Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Awesome, yeah. I might be jumping the gun. I see the pile of books there, but I'm just You're curious. allowed to read them freely. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious if you had a recommendation for like, like a, a sort of a seminal book that yeah. would be about the Montessori approach. What age is your kiddo? Uh, she's in a lift, so she's just, okay. she's yeah. at, uh, three years old. You know, I don't know how heady or like, you know, matter of fact you like to read. One of my favorite books um, is called Montessori Madness by Kevin Eisler. I think it's on the list I'm going to give you when we leave today. He's a Montessori parent that was like, wow, why didn't I know anything about this? And he said, I want to write a book to tell people about it. So it's written kind of from a layperson's point of view. And then there's like things like um, uh, Montessori Science Behind the Genius that talks about, you know, it's a research-based book that really talks about why Montessori functions so well as it does. And so, you know, there's like 90 books in between that. But those kind of are two spectrums that might fit for you for that. Um, and that's going to be on a list that you're hearing. Yes. Okay. Which I'm going to ask Glenn after he introduces himself to get me off the top here. Oh. Go ahead, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was manning the door earlier, so I'm Glenn, family liaison, assistant director, whatever Barbara asked me to do throughout the day. Um, so obviously uh, Barbara's husband and father of two graduates and a grandparent of three current learners here. So yeah. it's been a, uh, a That nice is so passion. much fun. I didn't yeah. know how much more fun that was going to be than uh, earlier. Yeah, to sneak down your own and peek in there and just see the, the magic happen. So. <laughs> It's, a, it's been a, a joyful ride for 26 years, I think. 26 so, years, yeah. We've been doing this. So. And we've been also uh, fortunate enough to be around some amazing parents, too, which also makes this thing work. So uh, it's been a whole team effort. So glad you're here. And anything we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay? So if we started the school, Glenn said, I'll give you one year. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, it's all I need. Just do the after school program, you know, and then I'll have it under control. And here he is, 20, 25 plus years, years later. Years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we really like each other. We have lunch together. Yeah, it's, it's, every day. it's pretty, pretty Sometimes amazing. it's late in the day. What, what did you mean? I'm sorry. I, I, put, I have some things coming off the top here. That's amazing we work together in the same building for that. I mean, like, <laughs> me and my wife, we were all in the same place. No offense, but it ain't happening. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, not that it would matter. We don't really see each other most of the day. We're doing different yeah. things, but yeah. we catch up at lunchtime <laughs> at the end of the day. So, yeah. 
Any, anybody else have anything? I have a question. Sure. I have the same question, but maybe for like grandparents and other family members, like would that first one be good or um, like information for them because I just find it helpful coming from like an outside source sometimes, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're not alone. Yeah. I mean, it's just true. Like, people are like, what? What do you mean? You're right. going, you know, like, aren't you going to do this or that? Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we did. Yeah. You're saying I didn't raise you right, right? Right. Um, so I think same kind of thing. I would think about, um, you know, what is it that they might be concerned about this? Uh, so, like, positive discipline, monastery classrooms, sometimes families struggle with um, their parents or grandparents not believing in the philosophy of discipline, right. you know, so this is really good for that purpose, you know, so if that's part of that. Um, I did bring the Trevor Iso book out here. Um, this Montessori for Every Family is also uh, really, really good. Um, if they're like, but how do you know this works, you know, Montessori right. Science kind of genius. Okay. So, you know, it's just, I would probably go in that direction. But, but you are going to get this list of, book, of uh, books, and I could pass them around if y'all want to. When you want to pass them sure. around. Um, there you go. And um, so you can kind of circle things as we talk about them. Well, maybe you want to see if you can find Monastery Madness by Trevor Eisler in my next case. Thank you. Those, those are good questions. Go ahead, Jason. Keep us going. He's like, I forgot I had a job. Mm -hmm. Going. This just kind of tells you what we already learned. There's a staff director on the website if you want that too. These are the two most important, most popular members yep. of the school community. If they didn't greet you when they walked in because they're like, hello, it's past five o'clock, are we leaving by now? Uh, so Presley is a 12 year old, they're both rescues. Um, two of our five dogs at home. Tico also a rescue. Um, Presley went through the formal kind of um, pet therapy training. I did most of that myself with Tico. Tico's still learning uh, for sure, but they love him so much, you know, and it's so hard. So um, they get lots of visitors from, from kiddos that are having an emotional moment to just kids that just want to, um, you know, pet a pup for a minute or read to a dog. So um, they're, we're pretty busy up there. Thank you. Did everyone get one of them? You can keep going, Jason. So I kind of shared most of this. You can keep going um, to see what I forgot. You know, if you don't know much about uh, Dr. Maria Montessori, one thing you might want to know is she was one of the first women doctors in Italy in the early 1900s. And you can imagine the early 1900s, people were like, women can't be doctors, mm -hmm. right? Even her father was not friendly about this conversation because she could be a nurse, a seamstress, or a teacher. But that's it. But if we fast forward through her discovery of observing children diagnostically as a, as a doctor, and then realizing that how much they could learn um, with just the right material. So she started working with other people um, throughout Europe um, at that time, and was like, we, you know, like this makes sense. If we do this with these really young children, um, we could really make a difference for them for their life. And really, like, Magda Gerber, if you know much about our infant toddler program in the house up on the hill, she believed if you give children at the, that youngest age, zero to three, um, the best environment to set personal boundaries and um, you know be respectful to each other, that it can prevent years of therapy later in life. And this was also in the early 1900s. So what was neat about when Dr. Maria Montessori opened what she called her first children's house, her Casa de Bambini, um, she um, uh, no, was just mostly watching children. And so at the time, there was this tenement housing in Italy, and the, the person that oversaw the housing, both parents were working, and children were just running wild during the day, and they were destroying parts of this housing unit. And they were like, you know, you work with children. I've seen what you did at the hospital. Come and, and run a school. For these young children and so she did she was um, actually um, she felt so honored that someone thought she could do this with young children and from this became kind of a method but more of a philosophy about learning and um, as she watched children 
she would see what they were doing and then she would add that. Like if children came in oftentimes dirty, she put face washing in as a material or scrubbing the chairs because of the soot from the heat in the building. And you'll still see those same type of materials in the early childhood for different reasons. Not always are they practical. Sometimes they are. There's paint all over the chair. Sometimes the child's face is dirty. I watched my five-year-old um, granddaughter today um, do wash all the dishes that the children had eaten staff with. And so she and a peer went and filled up these big, you know, tin buckets. And she put the, um, had the teacher put the disinfectant in the last one, the sanitizer. And she washed and she rinsed and she sanitized and then she put them back away after she dried them off. And I was just watching this whole process and at one point she was like, with this towel's wet, and she kind of dropped on the floor and then she was like, oh, I guess I should put it, you know, she went back and put it up. But just watching her being a member of a community where she could do this. And, um, you know, but to think about this starting in the early 1900s, it really didn't come to the United States until about the 1960s. And, um, gosh, which World Fair was it? 1952, maybe, World Fair um, in New York City. Uh, Dr. Ray Montessori created a glass classroom. Thank you. Um, where parents and people from the world could come and see what a Montessori environment was like. And that started the movement in the United States which there's now, I don't know, thousands, thousands of Montessori schools throughout the United States. We're like one of a few in this area, so it is sometimes you feel like you're on an island when people talk to you, they're like, you go, where, what is that? I've heard about it, um, and so forth. So, you know, it's, it's a process. Um, so we are a nonprofit organization. We became a charter school in 2001. So if your child's in early ed, um, they get preference to come here as a kinder. And that means that if there are more early childhood kiddos than we have kinder spots, it never happened, then they won't get in. But in most cases, if they're here for early ed, they automatically get into kinder. Um, and, um, and then once they get into first level, they're in for as long as they want to be here. Um, is there anything else on that one? Uh, just to focus on the whole child. and so. When we were creating with our initial staff, maybe five years in, we started to think about what is it we support as holistic education. So we came up with these components. So obviously intellectual doesn't always mean that they test well, right? It's getting them to think, process, problem solve. So intellectual, social, obviously, emotional, ethics, you know, like really making ethical decisions, wellness, um, creativity, school success is that you know, um, we had a, a question when the second year I was teaching, as I was still running the school at, at Community Montessori, um, I was watching children take the I Step test, what it was called then, and there was a question that said, third grade I Step math, how many ladybugs fits on this blade of grass? And um, the child came up to me and said, I don't know what to put. It depends on, depends on if it's a mom and his babies, or if it's, you know, five adults, or if they're all babies. And I was like, oh, you know, like, when you do this part, the intellectual part, sometimes, you know, they don't know how to just do what somebody else wants to see. And so we realized that we had to do enough of that. We're not going to drill and skill them. If you're here to get a really good uh, I-STEP test, this isn't probably the place for you because we are not going to have them focus on that all day long. You know, that's just not what we'll do. We will help them to do whatever they want to do with that information, right? So maybe you know this, but the whole I-Learn assessment is changing next year, and so they're going to four assessments a year. The first three are kind of formative assessments. My understanding is they won't really count for anything, and then there'll be a very sh much shorter summative assessment to try to reduce testing. We went from four to one. I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, we'll see how that part works out. But, you know, same to children, age appropriate, you know, so that, those are all the questions, and that's true. That will depend on if they're going up and down both sides of the grass, how big the grass is, and all of those things are true. But what do you think this person's wanting you to answer? You have a ruler and you have a ladybug. You know, they're like, probably just how many of that ladybug will fit on this plate of grass. Like, so sometimes you have to answer questions, questions for different audiences, right? So we teach them how to answer for that audience, but we're also not going to give them a thousand 
uh, paragraphs to read and answer questions just so they'll get a good test question. All right, go ahead. I was wondering, um, is there a lot of good communication between like, the teachers? Like, say, this, do they, will they see that your kid is still as here and they might, like, be like, hey, like, our son, like, Keenan, you know, he's really good at the numbers or yeah. something like that. Like, will they be, like, driven to, like, double down on that? Like, oh, we really, don't, like, Keenan, he really loves science, so I don't know if, like, will he be doing more science stuff or will there be more opportunity for that? You know, seeing that the kids got special abilities or something mm -hmm. and then kind of let them go and experience that. Yeah, and so the room, especially early childhood, right, is where your kiddo is. Uh, Keenan be fine. Okay, fine. Yeah, so in both the early childhood and the 6 9 environments, they have a lot of, of, of freedom um, to choose things they want to practice or learn about. Um, most of the times parents ask the other question, when they're really interested in science, you're going to make sure they do reading, you know? Yeah. So there is a balance of all that. Uh, if we're doing, you know, our best at something, we're going to try to help them to read through science, right? So we're, we're going to try to use what their strengths and interests are to get them to do the things that feel more labor, yeah. like laborious to them. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Sure. But also helping them to, you know, like what happens with those, those creative moments or those interests oftentimes like leads to a skit that they create for a group of people, you know? Um, and so th those things are really neat too. Yeah. I'm just going to add on to that too because we also follow that order within their brain development, right? You're probably thinking, okay, if he doesn't learn math now, how's he going to do it in high school? How's he going to get to college? Yeah. That's a realistic uh, thought that a lot of us put into it. But as we've seen this actually flow ourselves with our own two daughters, I had that same thought when we first started. It's like, yeah. ah. And so what happens is learners are not are continuing to grow within their brain development and as they get older what we call appropriate developmental pressure i guess so to speak of expectations mm -hmm. right. as they get a little older and also too they continue to uh, move forward with confidence rather than just repetition and powering yeah. in over and over they're able to problem solve critical thing and as they get older then a little, a little bit more expectations put on them to look at that uh, as far as geometry, trigonometry, chemistry, yeah. all that stuff that they're going to have to take in high school. For sure, and we're the type of parents too, I don't expect my kids to even have it all period out of 18. Sure. You know, I'm over here, there's still stuff I'm trying to, you know, and yeah, I, think, sure. I think this is the right spot. That's how we, we both feel very comfortable with our kids here because we're just starting out because of that, leading them that way. Yeah. Positive, for sure. Right. And I'm not going to fib, I had a little doubt when I first started with that. The other yeah. was because we had two kiddos, one was very driven, one was just very um, dreamer. dreamer. Yeah. 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 And, so, and so, yeah, and so I had to learn real quick to kind of channel some of my agreements given to what learning should look like, allow it to happen, and yeah. both went on to IEU and uh, academically so, yeah. Well, in that school <clears throat> success part, sometimes the question becomes like, but what about SAT or ACT? How do we make sure they're going to get into college? And maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but now there's like a thousand plus colleges now that make, make ACT and SAT a choice. Like you don't have to do the ACT and SAT anymore. They'll look at other things that you've done. So what we, many of us in the room, remember as the kind of gold standard is all changing. It's changing all the time. And so, you know, we have kind of been in that mode for a long time. And so we just want to help that. And then the last piece is aesthetics, you know, helping them to find Glenn is the handler of our seven foot boa um, in that stake that's out there. And, um, you know, like finding the beauty in that. Some of us in this room might be scared to death of snakes. We're like, oh my God, I don't want to see a snake, right? But even if we find an ant in the room, you know, you'll see the children go over with a tiny insect catcher and catch it and look at it and think about it and talk through it, right? Because we are really trying to help them to understand the beauty in, in all things, right? Not just smash it, you know, do the easy part of that too. By the way, she's in my office to be able to That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, about 550 in Princeton High School is what you're part of. Um, school should be an extension of home. Home should be an extension of school. And so you won't hear things like homework, but you're, you'll hear work at home. We hope that you create an environment at home that looks similar or an extension of what they do at school. So instead of, um, 
and don't be offended. Instead of praise charts or chore charts that you've given, instead maybe you'll have a family meeting and talk about what we want to discuss as a family. And that's not a time for you to bring your 19 things and have time to hear one of their things, but it's like talking as a family, you know? And your child might say, I don't like it that you're on the phone all night, you know? And, and being like really humble and honest about it, like it's true. I am, and I'm going to try to make one night a week where I tell my work that I'm not available so that we don't have that. And so we all make concessions and talk through it. They're like, I don't like that I have to clean my room every single Saturday. Like, I like Saturdays, and I feel like it's always just like hovering over me. Like, okay, what do you want to do differently? I want to just be able to do my own laundry and put the sheet up on my bed and not like do a thorough vacuuming and dusting every week. So how often can we do the dusting? Like uh, once a year? How about once a month? You know, and so you're, you're negotiating as part of a family instead of here's the chores you have to do as a, as a child, you know. So that respect piece, and that's what we do as a community, is, is to talk and negotiate and collaborate instead. Things you can do to support the consistency at home. Model the behaviors you want to see in your child without double standards. So let's go back to the gaming or phone. So if you have restrictions on how much gaming or phone time maybe a teen would have, um, but yet you are on the phone or gaming for hours and hours, you're like, but I'm the adult, you know, I've had a hard day, right? And so we ask you to think about how do you model the behaviors you want to see with your kid. You know, if you ask them to speak kindly about people and then you talk unkindly about coworkers, right? Like how, how are we doing those things? And so when we do have those human moments, we say, you know, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have talked like that about that person. And we model that behavior too. Or if we know that we fell short with them, we model that as well. It's hard, you know, because they're screaming at us or upset. And, you know, we had a moment and we're like, well, you made me get all upset. Well, is that really what we want to teach them? That their sibling made them hit them, you know? So, like, trying to be that humble piece. Discipline. We say interdiscipline, um, and we tell oftentimes new kiddos more than once, we don't have any trouble at our school. And so that is probably the hardest part, especially for that 9, 10, 11 year old who has struggled with being in trouble at another school, and we say we don't have any trouble and they don't believe it, you know? And so we're like, listen, you make choices and there are consequences to our choices. If someone dropped all their things on the floor and you helped them to pick them up, your consequence might be like, that made you feel good because it helped that person. You know, if they dropped all their stuff on the floor and you laughed at them and everyone else started laughing too, and then you might have felt like, oh, that wasn't the right thing to do, right? It didn't make me feel as good as I thought it was going to be. So really, you know, helping them with that interdiscipline part. I had this friend of mine, a wonderful friend years ago, we were teaching at the same time, and she said, oh, I figured out how to get my first graders to stand in line, in a straight line. I said, oh, really? How so? And she goes, I use the thumb method. Now, please don't be offended if you're using this method. I apologize. But I just think it's an interesting thought. And so she would go, I said, well, tell me. So she would do this if they were too far over here, this. And when they eventually got a straight line, she would do this. And then they would walk down the hall. And I said, well, what happens if you had a sub? Oh, the sub said they would never walk in a straight line. And I said, you know, that really is the difference. Like, we, we don't care if children are straight line, first of all. And we would like to have the children lead as much as possible. And so there might be children leading, and it won't be perfect. Um, but oftentimes, when they're the ones supporting that process, they're more, they feel more empowered, right? Have more ownership in that process instead of just following the adult all the time in that. So we really work towards that interdiscipline. You know, Marie Montessori said in a class of 35, two and a half to five year olds, I knew I was successful when I could walk out of the room and watch through the window and the children really didn't even know I was missing. That is also one of our key. We try to work in the environment so that the children, it doesn't matter. We're not the only ones saying, so-and-so do this. Quick, quick story, um, I was watching a three to six-year-old environment, and this new four-year-old was carrying a pitcher of water. And so he took a step and sloshed, you know, he filled it up to the brim, of course. The water spilled out. Immediately, he looked over the teachers, or one of the teachers, like, am I in trouble? He's looking, like, fearful. And the teacher didn't look, well, for whether she saw or not, it didn't matter. So he's like, 
okay. So he takes another step. Slosh comes out again. Again, he just freaks out and looks, and, and this time you can kind of tell she's, she's looking outside of her eyes, but doesn't say anything. He's like, well, this is kind of a weird place, right? You know, he takes another step. At this point, half the water's gone. It's not even spilling. So he starts pouring it out, and he's slipping around in the water, you know, like dancing. This five-year-old nearby says, hey, we're getting water all over our floor. Four-year-old looks at him like, and he's like, come on, I'll show you how to put it up. So the four-year-old calls the five-year-old, and show him how to put a, a, a towel on this on this um, sweeper, and he comes over and shows him how to pick it up and bring the water out, put it back on, and they do this. And this child, I swear, for 20 minutes. So there was not a drop of water on the floor. So that is what we see, right? We don't want to be the keeper of the room. We want the children to be the keeper of the room. And so that's what interdiscipline really means. I could talk about it for 10 hours. We use encouragement instead of praise. Some of you are like, are you kidding me? It's the only way I get my child to do X, Y, or Z. Or my team. And I say, well, I'm not saying praise doesn't work. We are just after internal, intrinsic motivation for them to do it because it's the right thing, not because they're getting something for it. And so, you know, if a child comes up to me and says, oh, I put all the numbers in order from 1 to 100 on the 100 board, and they're excited, I'll be excited. What I don't do is tell them, now you've got your gold star. Or now, look at everybody. Look at them. They're the best. And now this child who's been working for two weeks on the 100 board, who's only gotten to 50, how do they feel about that? You know, like their best work and their best work are not the same. We don't prepare children. We don't have like a pizza party for children that pass an I learned assessment. We look at each child as their individual progress in that part. So I'm going to celebrate with them. You did. You put all the numbers together. It looks like you feel good about that. I feel great. Oh, what was the hardest part? 60s. Why is the 60s hard for you? Because I can't remember the 60s or the 90s. I'm like, oh, yeah, they look similar. Right? Like we have this authentic, just like you might have with a coworker, instead of feeling like they need me to give them their stamp of approval. And sometimes children come in like they, they feel like they need that because they've received that before. They were the best in their class, or et cetera. And so we'll say, do you think that I don't care for you if I don't tell you that was a good job? And they go, yeah. Like, can I tell you a secret? I care for you even if you didn't do your best work. It's OK. You know? And so we just don't want them to look at us as their sense of, a, sense of approval, right? So instead. Questions about that? Thoughts, comments? Yeah? Uh, this is like a question. How do you maintain patience, practical things that you have done or still do, to be patient in the moment of child or whatever, acting out or whatnot? That's like my most important question. And then later, if you have time, what inspires you to start and what continues to inspire you to continue on? Yeah, so I always say one of my children, I won't tell you which one, was my teacher in that, you know, they gave me lots of ways to practice that, and sometimes I did well and sometimes I didn't. I think the bigger answer is that um, I understand child development, you know, and I'm not trying to ask a child, which is why we ask that, you know, you don't need to bring your children to this because it's, it's like impossible, right, for them to be able to sit through this adult conversation. So when I see a child that's acting up, uh, Glenn and I were supporting a, a young person. It was their first time away from their mom and their grandparent, and they were really struggling. And so we weren't upset because we knew what they were going through, and we were just trying to help be there for them. We couldn't stop them from crying or you know, pushing at us. We knew that they were just protesting that their life had changed. And today, they helped another child that was struggling coming in. Go, it's okay, come on in, you know? Like, that's the beauty of that. When you see that so many times, it, it's not personal, you know? Sometimes with our own kiddos, we can really convince ourselves, like, you're just trying to make me late for work, right? We can believe that that's really what they're doing, when instead, they're just being a human that isn't maybe chained to a clock. Right? Like we are, you know, like we live by the clock. They don't live by the clock, except our five-year-old grandson who now lives by the clock because he's got a watch and that's important to him. 
But, you know, like, we want them to be in their own time and space. And if you really need to be somewhere, we've got to set them up for success and start way earlier than we think in our mind that we need to. And we might have some extra time at the end, right? So those are the things that I've learned along the way. And I think the things that inspired me was when we first had our first child, we had taken her to many, gosh, probably five different daycares. And I was, I might cry, I was not inspired. I wasn't inspired by the 15, 16 year old that was patting her on the bottom with a sheet over her head to make her go to sleep. I wasn't inspired by, um, you know, only the good children could go to the movie at the end of the week. I wasn't inspired by um, the uh, teaching this daycare that my child needed this heart monitor on, this breathing monitor, to make sure I knew that she wouldn't stop breathing because she had apnea and going over at lunch where she was sleeping and there were no one could hear the monitor, right? So I just, I felt like we could do this better. And these are the people that will be taking care of us, that need environments that care and respect for them, that also set boundaries for them and can know when to be firm and know to, when to be, you know, to, to listen and be humble. And I just felt like we had enough people that would have the synergy of that that could make that happen. So inspired, uninspired, I don't know which way it was, but that's the reason. Um, purposeful developmental independence, you know. Um, so our children had, were making their own lunches um, at six years old. Uh, they were going to the grocery, not every week, but most weeks we would give them a budget. And so they were like, but I really want to, um, a, what's it called, one of those little meals we make lunch up, a, a lunchable. Like, yeah, it's going to take $3 of your budget. You're like, that's okay, I'll eat apples for this other lunch day, right? I'm like, okay, so we, you know, we've agreed that we need to have fruits or vegetables, da 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 um, They were, um, you know, helping with, they had credit cards, they were helping to pay the bills, they paid their own credit card bill, they called in their own doctor's appointments, they signed up at the doctor's office, right? Like, those were things they could do. And so we had them do those things. Uh oh, are you okay? Um, so, you know, helping to know, I, I can't tell you how many teens these days don't want to get their driver's license, they don't want to really drive, um, they haven't probably had the developmental independence they could have had that led to that. And it doesn't mean anyone did anything wrong, we're in a society of like, you know, moving fast, right? Um, so thinking about what roles, you know, I, again, I'm a big believer in the family meeting, not that we had them as consistently as we wanted to, but that was important. And so, you know, we told our children, daughters, we don't have a 529 plan for you. You're going to college, you need to make a plan, and then you can tell us what you need from us, and we'll, we'll let you know what we're able to offer to your plan. But you are taking care of that. You need to figure out where you're going, you filled out all the papers, like, there's a lot of parents that fill out all those things for their kids. The kids don't do any part of that for college, and then they just show up the first day. And they haven't had that developmental independence along the way. So, you know, having time for you and your partner or your child to think about, like, what developmental independence can we give them now? Maybe that's a fish. Maybe it's just unloading the dishwasher or folding the laundry, right? The, the things that are already there. Self-regulation, beside and with, instead of for and to. So, you know, when a young person, self-regulation sometimes comes up when, you know, a child might um, get really upset if they don't get to go to McDonald's and get a Happy Meal on Friday because you did that last Friday. And so you're trying to figure out how to help them to self-regulate instead of going, well, that's fine, if you scream like this, we'll never go back again, right? Um, you're on the way to Disney World and there's a big fight, you're like, we will turn around this car right now, right? So those are the opposite of self-regulation, that's us regulating them. And so them self-regulating would be like giving them time and space to figure out how they're going to work out this problem, right? So they're upset with their brother or sister, you know? And so, you know, we might say, uh, you're angry. You can say, I am angry at you because of... Share. I'm angry because you're stupid. Whoa, wait. <laughs> so you're calling them names right now, and so you can tell them why you're angry. I'm angry because you wouldn't let me play with you outside. But you, are you finished? Okay. Are you okay for the so take a breath and make sure before you speak, you can do so respectfully. I didn't want you to play outside because I wanted to play with the neighbor by myself. 
So we would say, but you always like them better than me, you know. And so helping them to regulate their emotions with some support, mentoring, coaching, instead of like alternatives, right? Which is what we feel sometimes, what maybe our society tells us to do, and instead trying to figure out how do we do the pieces of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Questions or comments about that? Sometimes we have to self-regulate ourselves mm -hmm. before we self-regulate, help them with self-regulation. You know, parents will say like, but, but, you're, but I've heard your school doesn't believe in time out. I don't know what else to do. I'm like, what about you taking the time out? <laughs> you know, like if you're feeling frustrated, I'm going to go in my room because I'm not liking the way you're speaking to me and I need a break. So I'm going to go in my room. No! You know, can you shut the door? I'm going to have a few minutes to myself because I need to get myself ready. And then they can scream outside the door. And then when you feel ready and prepared, then you can go back out and figure out what's next. You know, so when, when we do to them, and that doesn't mean that a child does never have a consequence for their actions. Um, I believe that is also important and true. But I also think it's about what, you know, if we can do something in the moment that's natural or logical into the situation. So they ate all the Oreos, they ate 15 Oreos. And the natural consequence of that is they're probably not going to feel so great. That is just the natural consequence to that. And we're at Oreos until we go back to the grocery and maybe we'll get more, maybe we don't, we don't get them every time, right? Like there's enough consequence there that there doesn't have to be more. But the hardest thing for new families to figure out is we'll say like, we want to share something with you, but we really are encouraging that you don't punish them at home for something that happens at school and you're like, they've been the teacher, you know, like, it's okay. <laughs> Everyone's all right. That's hard to hear that your child at three years of age just put a welt on a child on the teacher's arm. I know that that's hard to hear. However, we have handled it here in this way. And we've decided that there doesn't need to be any other thing that needs to happen here. And we feel like we've got to a place where we've been able to have a remorseful conversation. We don't force children to say, I'm sorry. We don't. That's not self-regulation. That's us regulating them. So sometimes sorry comes out, but how many people have seen a child go, sorry, and then go back to doing whatever they're doing immediately, right? You know, so getting to that point where they could see, uh, there, there was a biting incident uh, this past week, and we were supporting the young person with coming back to school and talking about what can we do with the teacher to help them feel safe and supported. And so at first, the, the child was kind of like, I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm going to go back to work. Let me know when you're ready to have the conversation. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, I'm going to go back to work. But I'll come back in a minute and see if you're ready to have the conversation, right? Like, that is control that I can take because I'm not going to play back and forth between, um, I'm ready, I'm ready. No, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to do that. I be the adult in that situation and say, I'll come back in a minute. I'll know that when you're reading the book or doing something quietly that you're ready and we'll try again. You know, and then they know. I mean what I say, I say what I mean. Um, Conscious Parenting um, also has a book. Uh, bar, um, Dr. Savari, uh, Dr. Shabali Savari. Uh, I love this book. She also has a book called The Wicked Family, which I also think is fantastic. Um, and it just comes, it's an easier read as well. It just has a lot of practical components, but it really just means like thinking about the why that we do, you know, when, when Glenn and I, had, our children were young, we were like, do we want them to take tennis lessons or do we want to start playing tennis as a family? And we had a long conversation about that. And we decided that we were just going to start playing, playing what we call fondren tennis, which it, it, that, that evolved into that. Because we realized when we went to play tennis, like we were all hitting it all over the place. So we decided that whatever it hit, we play it off of the whatever it did. So we just kept going. And so that became our fondren tennis. And as we got better at it, we started talking about what some of the parameters are. And eventually, as a group, we decided we didn't really care about keeping score like the way we do in tennis. So we just would just play back and forth. And sometimes we would keep score because one of, one of us or a couple of us wanted to do that. But it was a conscious decision, not just like, I remember this parent the second year of school was like, if your child isn't in two to four things a year, you are almost abusing them. And I remember thinking, wow, what led to that family feeling as if they had to have them in dance class, soccer, all the different things in order to not be abusing their child. 
And so we would try to make very conscious decisions about why we wanted to do something. Keep it up with the neighbors or because our child really felt a passion for that. Um, help your child self-advocate, set personal boundaries, and show respect and care for others. That means with us too. You know, like one of our one of our daughters was really big, like nobody eats off my plate. And sometimes when grandfather would come in town, he would just reach over with a fork and say, mm, let me try this. And she would just oh, get so angry. And so if we were consciously thinking about this, we would prepare ahead of time and say, do you want to say to your grandfather that you do not want him to eat off your plate before we get the plate so that we don't have this situation? And it took her a while to eventually set those boundaries, but it really taught her. I mean, how many of us know people who don't set boundaries with coworkers, right? And we just live in like this sense of like regret or, you know, like we're always the one in trouble or, you know, that people don't treat us right when we're not really telling people that we're upset about something. We don't like it when they eat our food in the, in the refrigerator, etc. Things that might be different here. So we talked, you just went and pulled them all up. We talked about the work at home and absence waivers. Who, who would like to share what an absence waiver is? Let's see who's reading Jess's Google notes. <laughs> Anybody? I mean, if they're not going to be here. So yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, like, sometimes a family might be going on a trip together, and they're like, we'd like to do an absence waiver for this, and my eight-year-old's going to help, you know, budget for the gas, and they're going to see how many miles we go, and, you know, we're going to do all this math work together, and so you might say, here's what our plan is for these four days of absences, the teacher would be like, oh, yeah, I think that's great, and why don't you also add this and this, or I'm not sure, that would probably be easy for them, but maybe you could do this, and so you do this plan, and then you just type it into the document, hit submit, and it goes to the teacher. And the teacher is saying, like, oh, yeah. And it, and it waves the absence. absence. It actually, like, dissipates the absence. It's a waiver. Now, if you only did, like, your child play cards with you for an hour, they're not going to waive the absence, you know? Um, and if the child's sick, like, let them be sick. <laughs> you know, like, we don't want you to do an absence waiver. But we want you to, you know, like for a lot of the teens, they'll know what they need to do. You don't really need to write the absence waiver. You just need to show what they did, right? So they'll say they finished up all their work in the classroom, they finished their algebra assignments, whatever, right? And then same thing. Um, so Jesse already told you about the emails. There is good stuff in there. I know it's a lot. We really try to communicate well. That might feel like too much to people, so read what you can. But it really is there to help you to know how to best um, be a part of the community. Multi-age levels, sometimes families don't realize that or someone didn't come to the original. So, you know, in a three to six-year-olds, kinder is in that environment. So they're a three-year-old, then they're a four-year-old, then they're, they're five-year-olds. So our two twin grandkids are the five-year-olds in the environment and our new uh, three-year-old daughter or granddaughter that's coming this week will be a three-year-old and so these five-year-olds were a three-year-old environment and they're mostly like just very slowly learning the ropes right the four-year-olds practicing a lot of things the five-year-olds like the leader in the environment right and so they're also a kinder so a kinder is in that same environment they don't go to a different room to be a kindergarten and then, then when they go to first level um, they move to the six to nine year old environment so then they're in that environment for three years. So they're in the three years of this environment, three years, six to nine, three years at nine to 12. And so they're hopefully with the same teachers, co-teacher team, there's two teachers in each environment. Sometimes both are licensed teachers, sometimes one's licensed teacher, one's Montessori certified, sometimes they're both Montessori certified, it just depends on the co-teaching team. You can read that all in their bios. And so, you know, there's these two teachers. With, so each year, the third levels move up to the 9 and 12, and a new set of first levels come in. So two-thirds of the environment stays the same-ish, right, in that, in that same process. Questions about any of that? Yeah? I, um, I was wondering, what do you think about, like, what are your thoughts on siblings being in the same class at some point? Mm -hmm. um, like, we have, we have four boys, but I know next year, JJ, Potentially be like could be in class with his brother and our two youngest that to be honest like this year goes well we want to put them in and they're very close in age like, yeah. I don't know the exact they're like a little over a year apart yeah 
Right. So, yeah. But how do you feel about, I know you want the independence and then make it friends with others, but uh, especially how we are as a family, we do everything as a family. We're yeah. very, we take care of each other. Like, sure. uh, JJ has had a little bit of adjustment, like not being with me all the time. Right. They, like when they're at home, they're, they're like, they're like, separate right? Like, yeah. So, yeah. Like, right. how do you feel, it, like, is there, when you, Reason that you know, like if we was like, I do prefer like if we could get our sibling. If a family says they really think that's what's best for the kids, we will let you make that decision. Yeah. We might also encourage you to rethink it depending yeah. on the situation. Sure. I mean, like in early ed, they're outside together all day, mm -hmm. you know, with the whole crew, so they don't have to be in the same environment. So our daughter and, and son-in-law will have three children in early ed, and they're going to be in three different studios, even though they yeah. try to think like. Maybe this one could be with this one. Oh no, that would be good. You know, like yeah. they really were consciously thinking through that. And they decided what was best yeah. for their own independence was to not do that. And the twins were inseparable. Like they yeah. did everything together. But I think it was the right decision. And sometimes when I'll go back out to the woods, I'll see them playing together. Yeah. And most of the time I don't. You know, so yeah. but they play together all night when they get home. So it really just depends. We, we've had a set of twins that were in the same environment together from the time they were in three to six all the way through they graduated, what, two years ago. You know, and that works for that family. So, you know, we're, we don't feel like we know better than you. But right. we might, you know, a teacher might question you. You all will at least want to hear us out. Like, 100%. You know, yeah. I, that's all I would say. Or the teacher might say, like, I really I know that you want them together this year, but I really think when they move up next year, you should consider this because of that. And yeah. that would be something for you to consider. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, snacks and lunches, so you might already know this, you've been doing it. Um, so we don't have things like uh, sodas, and we ask you to bring just one small dessert if you didn't read that. Um, you know, for, for a snack, if you're packing that, if you're in extended learning, you might pack two snacks. Um, fruits, vegetables, eggs, cheese, crackers, you know, something that, you know, an egg's fine, um, a cheese stick, you know, something that they can open by themselves and they can, they can eat whenever they're hungry because there's not like a snack time in any environment. There's a snack table and when children are hungry, they go and sit at the snack table and eat. Um, as they get older, um, they eat a lot more, you know, at the snack table. They won't bring a lunch to save their lives. No, I'm kidding, but that sometimes happens, right? And so when they're ready, help them to do that. Help them to like make it. I was talking to a family today and it's like, yeah, I've made all their lunches the night before. I'm like, what role can they play in the Maybe not this minute, because you've got a lot of things going on, but what role can they play in the future? And then they're just different parameters. Birthdays, different studios do different things for birthdays, so if you're not sure and you believe in birthdays, you can ask. Um, yeah, keep going. I don't think there's a few that go together. Yeah, so, you know, just this prepared environment, it's not as significant right now because people aren't coming into the building, but if you were subbing or volunteering, which I hope that you're going to come back to do um, to that workshop at the end of the month because um, we value having you in the rooms. You will learn about your kiddo. The studio teacher might say, don't come to your child's studio right now. Let them know that you're just in the building at first and then move over to them because that will be an easier transition most of the time if your child's young. Um, and so, you know, there's different things that you do for that. Come back at the end of August and we'll tell you more. Um, drop off and pick up so you know that part now. And I don't, is there any questions about drop off and pick up right now that could happen? And then, you know, just you know, the consistency of being on time. Sometimes families don't realize, they're like, oh, we got here 15 minutes late, it's not that big a deal. But especially for young children, if, if, they're, if their class is starting with a group meeting and they come in and everyone's getting up, they could be off for the rest of the day because they don't know what they missed or what they didn't hear. And so, you know, that part of coming in and so that child can have that whole morning experience oftentimes really helps. Even at that lesson age, when a teen comes in and they miss that, they might miss the announcement, there was some activity going on, and they can get kind of all in an in a, um, emotional state because of all that. Um, other ways to stay connected. So you've already gone to the first parent partner conference. And so those are made to really help you to collaborate with the teacher. So it will always start with what are the strengths of your young person. That doesn't have to be an academic strength. We just want to know, you know, how they change. What do you see? Um, 
as the child gets older and older, they will start leaving parts of that conference, and so that's really important. Sometimes that's really hard for them, and so, but it's also really important. So you have them all those months of the year. Like, yeah, question on that. Yeah. Because um, I, when we registered for the first one, is there the option to go ahead and sign yeah. up for all of the year? Because yeah. I only did the first one. So yeah, you can go back and sign up for all of them, so you can get the spot that you want. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, substitute workshop there, volunteer. So if you want to volunteer, like if, you, if, if your studio might be going on a going out trip, doesn't happen at three to six level, but the other age levels, um, you can uh, make sure that you're part of that. Child's work night for the early ed elementary is coming up on October 26th. And so it's a beautiful time for you just to come in and watch your child, let them give you a tour of what they've been doing. And sometimes, especially a three to six child, they'll bring up stuff that they've never touched before in their life. And they'll be like, hmm, this is going to be interesting. I wonder what they might do the teacher say with this. But it'll also be really interesting for you. you keep going, Jason. Um, the handbook and the emails are helpful. We review the handbook every single year. The whole staff does. And we really think about, is it saying what we're doing? It's not perfect, I'm sure, but it is something that we do. Um, Jesse. Um, We'll put this workshop on the informed Montessori blog. So if you go to our website and go to Kurt Families, you'll see the link to the blog there. And so it's got video presentations of all kinds of things in there. So, um, but he'll be putting that up in a few days um, so that you know you can see that. And we'll also have this whole conversation on a you know all the all the slides from that. So like each of this, these are all hyperlinked. So if you go to the slides, you can just go right to where that book is too. Um, ask questions, you know, like oftentimes when parents volunteer and sub, they come up with lots of questions, and, and it's okay to question any of us at any time. That is really what we believe. We don't have a statutory belief system that the people who have been here the longest know all the things. Like, I really value, we have a new staff member, or like we have three student teachers in the building come in, because they'll sometimes think, well, I thought that you all said you do this, like, oh yeah, I haven't thought about that in a while. I think we did say we did that. And we're probably not doing such a great job with that. Thanks for bringing that up for us, right? Because we want to set some goals to try to figure out how to be better at it. Um, and get involved with this partnership. You know, if, if you'd like to see about trying to be part of the PIP Council, um, so sometimes there are things like um, there's a book fair that the parents will do in a couple of months. Um, sometimes there are some chili cook-off type things or uh, um, s'mores night, so um, if you want to be a part of having those connective experiences in the building, we'd love to, to have you be a part of that. And then, you know, study this. I think the next slide kind of goes over these books. I think I've kind of talked about most of them. The one I couldn't find that must be out right now was, is one of my favorites, Kids Are Worth It, um, by Barbara Poloroso, um, giving your child a gift of interdiscipline. Um, and then how to raise a child in a Montessori way. We talked about, um, oh, these, these are really good. How to talk so kids will listen, and listen so kids will talk. And there's also a teen version of this, which is fantastic. How to talk so teens will listen, and listen so teens will talk. Um, children who are not yet peaceful, I don't know if I brought that book out. Yeah. Um, it's really great if you have a young person that is struggling with self-regulation. It gives you some great ideas. Uh, positive discipline. So we've had most of our staff take a whole workshop on positive discipline in the Montessori classroom. Really powerful about you know really how to support that child with that inner discipline. Um, mindset book is also pretty cool, especially if you have an older kiddo or a teen, um, you know that might be more of a black and white thinker. So it just kind of demystifies how we can have more of a growth mindset and when it's okay not to change our mindset. And Punished by Rewards, I couldn't find that book, but if you're not sure, like, you buy into that, uh, Alfie Cohn does a great job of saying why he believes we're punishing our children by giving them rewards. And so if you want to learn more about that thought process, that might be a good book, too. Jesse. Oh, yeah. All right. So she mentioned the blog, um, shoutingminds.com slash blog. Uh, anything exciting that happens uh, here in the school is probably going to go first to the blog, right? Um, this will be there. All the materials will be there linked. 
the sub volunteer workshop will be up there with all the materials linked as well. So if you need to go back and try to remember what it was she said to in response to your question, um, it's all in here. It's a little shaky because I'm not a videographer. Okay, but I'm getting there, bro. Um, you know, we have lots of ways that you can get involved. We we want to get away from where COVID took us. Nobody was in the building. Kids half of them weren't in the building. So we want you here. So obviously, if you can if you can do the the sub volunteer workshop and the background check, uh, please do that so we can have you in the building in the studios. But there's other ways too. Uh, you know, you have your volunteer commitment for the year, and if that feels intimidating, mm -hmm. I have a really easy way for you to uh, knock some of those hours out. Uh, you can sign up to take care of the National Playground on the weekends, which is just you know putting rocks back where they go and. Um, picking up any trash or clothing items, there's always uh, socks. All Your over child will probably <laughs> show you how to do all yeah. those things. <laughs> yes, I just had a parent just this morning email us and say it was so great. My daughter took so much pride. She showed me everything on the playground and then she put her hands on her hips, looked at the rocks and the trash and said, somebody's not honoring their commitment to our playground. You know, and so we all make this commitment to it, and it's great to see the kids take pride in the space. So come up on the weekend. You don't have to do the, the background check and the workshop to do that on the weekends because you're here outside with just your own kids. Um, watch for uh, emails and, and posts about coming events. Uh, we have the constant uh, curiosity, uh, which is an amazing theater space that's completely fully equipped with um, actual theater equipment, lighting, sound, everything. So the kids will put on plays, there will be big exhibitions there, lots of things going on, so watch for those. Um, at each level, they sort of have their own interesting thing that you're going to hear from me about. For instance, the islands do these sort of um, really entrepreneurial endeavors. The islands occupations, they do woodworking. They do um, gardening, they do fiber arts, they do a few other things. That picture there is actually their big sale. At least once, if not twice a year, Islands does a big sale where they sell, I mean, there was... That's the 12 to 14 year olds. Yeah, yeah, yeah 12 to 14, sorry, I use the internal mm -hmm. terminology here. Um, they, uh, they had everything, I mean, there was plants and seeds and then there's all these um, Items that were crocheted, cat hats. You go back and look at our social media, you'll see the cat hats are amazing and very popular. I mean, there was even some cornhole boards that some kids had made. Really professional looking stuff. And what's cool about these types of things is that, uh, you know, they, they offer for sale. You come and you buy it, right? And maybe it's your kids or maybe it's someone else's kids' things that you're buying. And then that money just goes right back into studios and when they go on a going out trip all of a sudden you, you're not paying anything because they sold enough things from their endeavors throughout the year to pay for that trip so you, you, you end up nothing out of pocket in some instances um, for the 9 to 12 they do these big um, big concept explorations where they pick up a, a point in time or maybe it's a turning point in history and then they branch out from there and all of these things tend to culminate in exhibitions um, in the CASA and in the, the MAC, which is our multi-purpose activity center. It's our term for the gymnasium. So you'll hear from me about those things. Um, and then, you know, I'm also your point of contact for supporting the community of Montessori in our community. Um, you know, we have multiple categories of donations that you can donate to support specific things. Sometimes even tragedy strikes a family and we would work to gather donations for the family. So you'll hear from us about that. Um, Maria's Way, if you've seen out front, the, the diamond space with the, the paved walkway, the granite papers, you can actually donate one of those and, and customize it for you and you can solidify your, your child's journey here in community Minnesota's legacy. It's pretty pretty uh, cool and very pretty. Um, and again, August 29th is the sub volunteer workshop, so I hope to see everybody there. Who's on social media? Who has a Facebook account? Facebook. Um, 
Okay, well, I'm a little pleased to see it actually got a low number. Um, who has Instagram? Right? Uh, I have my hands up for all of these. Who has a Twitter? I don't have a Twitter, but it's okay if you do. It's cool. X. Uh, oh, yeah. X. So <laughs> yes. Yes. Now. My bad. Who has X? Um, and then, of course, YouTube. So we're on all four of those. If something goes to the blog, it's then going to go to the social media to try to make sure that you saw it. And then it'll be in an email from me. And then I'll show up at your house with a neon sign. Did you see this? <laughs> um, but there's sometimes important information. Like I know some people. I email 12 times, hey, new family orientation, new family orientation, new family orientation, and I don't get them to sign up until I put it on Instagram. Because that's when they actually saw it. Oops, I gotta check that email. So, you know, lots of important info out there. Um, and maybe you're somebody who wants to um, see our success so much that you'd like to set up monthly donations, even small ones like five, ten dollars a month. That's something you reach out to me, Jay Flint. ShiningMinds.com. Uh, otherwise, I am here for whatever you need me for. And, uh, and I hope that we get lots of, of time to engage with each other. The curator of all of our information. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> um, infectious disease protocols, you know. If your kiddo's sick, have them stay home. You know, I know that's tricky. Um, if you might have a kiddo who has you know, uh, ongoing stomach aches or something, and always if there's something specific that's allergy related, we'll work with you on that. But otherwise, if they're sick, just have them stay home. Um, if they are COVID positive, they stay home for five days, um, and at least until their symptoms are finished, and then they can come back after that. They really should wear a mask for five days after that for the CDC guidelines. I know people aren't really wearing masks so much anymore, but that is the, still the guideline to try to keep others healthy. We've had several um, COVID cases, you might have seen that on our tracker already, um, and other infectious diseases this year, so um, we're just trying to keep staff in the building and keep you know doing school the way it should be done. So, A um, few reminders, slow, mindful, purposeful reflection about whatever you see or hear or you know help your young person self-advocate to talk to the teachers of course but think about like what should i do about this situation or that how do i help my young person to learn from whatever's happening um, read emails um, there's all the staff contact links you know log your volunteer hours so you committed to 10 hours of volunteer time um, and so there's a place on that current families list where you can log those hours um, might be um, for taking the, the rugs home once a month and laundering for the studio, or cutting out some lamination, or doing the natural playground mastership. Um, naturally connecting learning, so we talked about some of that work at home that's, that's purposeful and independence driven for the young person. Um, you know, uh, we'll have more of these PIP workshops along the years so you can kind of hear more things. And if there's something specific you want to hear more about, feel free to reach out to me, be confident at Shining Minds. Um, I think, is that it, Jesse? Is that the last slide? Or Jason, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? What does PIP stand for? Parent Involvement Partnership. You can get involved. I didn't know that. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Is the um, the sub workshop is that um, giving me like um, I guess showing me what it's going to be like or something? Yeah. So it speaks more specifically about what your role will be. Like you know, as you come in, because there's a co-teacher model, you're not like in charge. Yeah. Uh, or anything, and that makes people feel like whoo. But you know, we also have people that know what's <laughs> happening and going instead of a temporary company, right? So okay. it's doing that. So yeah. um, it'll help you know more about what your child's doing. And it's a child workshop that is just child, your child kind of showing you. Yeah, it's child's do. work night. So right. yeah, so you'll sign up for a block of time usually in the studio and you'll come in for that 30 minutes and just watch your child kind of go through the day and okay. you can kind of see what materials they've learned or what they're working on. So it's just for the early ed elementary. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I appreciate spending time with you. Have a great night.